Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Russell. I'm an alcoholic member of the Carl Gables Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, good evening. This is uh, uh, supposedly on step 12. I'm going to see how that works out. I, I, uh, I, I really like step 12. Um, I think it's a great step. And uh, I want, I, I, I probably, who knows what I'll talk about, but I'm probably going to talk a little bit about that deal. Uh, I'm, uh, it's been a real privilege. This is uh, about step 12. This thing, this deal I do. This is step 12. This is carrying the message and uh, part of it, and uh, and I enjoy doing this, uh, and it's important I do this. And uh, you know, there's a lot of forces in a man's life that, uh, or a woman's life, that will uh, impel you over a period of time uh, to stop this stuff. They'll tell you things. You know, it's the they'll tell you that maybe you're doing too much, or you ought to stop or slow down, or you know. You know, maybe you're well, maybe you're well now, or something like that. And uh, you know, I sponsor a young man who's a, a good, good guy, good kid. He's got about 20 years now. I started sponsoring when he had a year, and uh, he was going through a rough patch in his life. He was sponsoring about five or six people. He was going through a rough patch in his life, and uh, he came up to me and he t- he told me about the problems he was going through and uh, some of the things that were happening to him, and he felt pretty crappy about himself as we are wont to do from time to time. And he, he said he had been thinking and he decided that uh, uh, he wasn't doing his sponsees any good and he ought to tell him to get other sponsors. And uh, you see, that's basically what alcoholics do. You know, they, uh, they figure out the exact opposite thing. I mean, everything in his mind, and of course in his mind he was being very unselfish about this. What he figured it out is now that he was like diving into the pool of self-pity, Best thing to do was jettison these sponsees, which were basically, you know, they would call him up and every once in a while stop him from thinking about himself. <laughs> and also get rid of them. Uh, get rid of them. It's not like they had called up and said, I mean, because sponsees are pretty cool. You know, if they think you're worthless, they'll probably go ahead and get another sponsor. You know, it's not like they were jettisoning him. He had his best thinking on his best day at eight years sober was, why don't I just peel these sons of bitches off, you know, and then I can get into it real good. And, you know, I, of course, you know, I... What I counseled him to do was maybe to get about 20 more sponsees so he didn't have five seconds to think about himself, you know, and that's what he needed to do, and, and that's what he did. And He's got 20 years today. He's doing. So uh, I, uh, I, I want to talk, I really do want to talk about sponsorship and being sponsored in fellowship, which is such a big thing. What does it say in the big book? Practical experience has shown that nothing so much ensures sobriety than uh, intensive work with other alcoholics, intensive work with other alcoholics. It's one of those crazy, you know, I, I joke about alcoholics, you know, and you know how you, they never answer questions straight and we delude ourselves and I delude myself. Look, I'm just a regular alcoholic. I'm not a better alcoholic or worse alcoholic. I, I screw up all the time. I'm not perfect. Uh, I've got mind problems. i got a temper sometimes and I sometimes say things I shouldn't say and do things I shouldn't do and don't do things I should do and i gotta, I got I to gotta say that here tonight because my wife's here. Um, <laughs> So I got to back off, from, back off from all the crap I said before this, you know. <laughs> but I'm, I'm probably going to talk about her a little bit. But um, anyway, uh, in, in so, but um, so I want to talk a little bit about my experience. I'm going to read the big book, but I want to really talk about my experience as far as working with sponsors, being a sponsor, and fellowship in general. And uh, so, so one of the things that we do is, is uh, alcoholics is we just. Uh, don't really want to, uh, we really don't want to deal with the truth. I was watching, I caught a, I, I turned on TV and I was flipping last night and I got to that uh, movie, A Few Good Men with uh, uh, Tom Cruise and Jack Nicholson and it was right at the spot where Jack Nicholson looks at me and says, the truth, you can't handle the truth. And I said, whoa, I love that. That's like made for AA. Because <laughs> we are the people that can't handle the truth. You know what I mean? You know, more, what do you mean I need to do more? You know? <laughs> what are you talking about? I'm going to five meetings. Well, maybe you need to go to seven. What are you, crazy, you know? Do you have a license? Well, sort of. Are you married? Well, it's a long story. You know? <laughs> do you have a job? Well, kind of, you know. 
So it's one of those questions, really, that you ask people that are eight years sober when they come up to one or 20 years sober. It's one of those questions that we really don't. It's one of those questions that a sponsor will ask somebody, you know, because, you know, uh, one of the things, you know, that I've been relieved of, at least for today, is uh, that problem, with, uh, the, the problem that comes from thinking. You know, I, 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 I go to this Bible study. I go to a bunch of Bible studies, but uh, which is okay for me because it's part of my pursuit of God. It says, somewhere in the book it says, God couldn't would if he were sought. So my personal pursuit of God takes me there, my personal deal. That, I'm not saying, you know, you could walk out here and say, Russell says you got to go to a Bible study. You could say that. It would be wrong, but, I mean, you could say it. You could say anything you want. You're an alcoholic. But I'm just talking about my experience, you know. So it's what I do. It's not a bad thing. You know, Bill Wilson did it. Bob, Bob Smith did it, you know. Most of the first 100 alcoholics did it, you know, so I figured, what the hell, you know, it's good enough for me. What do I got to lose, you know? That's the book they were reading, the Bible, before they wrote the big book. And, uh, you know, they, they did say, rarely have we seen a person fail who's thoroughly followed our path. So I figured since their path was, Dr. Bob used to read the run, I think since their was fail, what the heck? <laughs> you know, because if I say, no, I'm never going to do that, that's sort of like contempt prior to investigation. And that's like not following the second step. And that will keep me in everlasting ignorance. So since I don't want to be stupid, I figured I'd do it. So that probably doesn't make any sense to a lot of people. But it made sense to me in any event. So uh, in any event, so I, I go to this Bible. And, and, uh, because, and because the interesting thing about the Bible, I want you to know this. is very interesting. I don't know if you know this. It's like all about God. I mean, if you think God is mentioned in the big book 600 times, you have no clue. It is like, he is like all over that deal. And um, it's something I noticed. Um, uh, you know, I get to hang around new guys in Alcoholics Anonymous, and even not so new guys, and I get to listen to them. And, uh, you know, you really need to listen to new people. It's, like, really, like, amazing. I mean, listen to them when they're sober, how they talk and how they think. It is unbelievable. It's, it's a, I, I don't even understand how they get past the age of 10, really. I, I don't understand how we make it to adulthood, you know. We, it must be because our society just sort of nurtures us because really if it was survival of the fittest, anybody who thinks the way we do should be snuffed out before we're 12. <laughs> everything is such a drama and such a cra and everything is so convoluted with the thinking and the, the whole bit and I'm just like that. And one of the things, you know, there's a part in the 11th step where it says, uh, where it talks about inspirational thinking. I came in here with intellectual thinking. Or logical thinking, you know, and, you know, you know, my best thinking, I was very logical, very intellectual, you know, and after thinking myself, after thinking over a long period of time, I wound up in the toilet, which is basically where we wound up, you know. So you want to make sure you never get, whoever that guy is, whoever that guy or gal is who was running your life before you got here, you know, whatever thinking they were involved in, whatever was going, you want to make sure they never get involved in your life again. So here's the deal. So in, in, the, uh, in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, they have this part where they talk about step 11. They talk about this kind of thinking we get involved in. It says, in thinking about our day ahead, we may face indecision. Who doesn't? We may not be able to determine which course to take. Here we ask God for inspiration, an intuitive thought or a decision. I mean, I don't even know. How do you do this thing without God? I mean, I don't know how you, I just really, I really don't know. I'm just not that smart. How do you do this thing without God? If all through the book it says we ask God for inspiration, we got, how do you do this thing without God? I mean, you. You could probably try to, I suppose. I just don't know how that works. Here we ask God for inspiration and intuitive thought of decision. We relax. We take it easy. We don't struggle. We are often surprised how the right answers come if we have tried this for a while. I don't know about you, but I'm looking for right answers. What used to be the hunch or the occasional inspiration gradually becomes a working part of the mind. How would you like that, to have the right answers come at you like that all the time as a working part of the mind? Being still inexperienced and having just made conscious contact with God, it is not possible that we are going to be inspired at all times. We might pay for this presumption and all sorts of absurd actions and ideas. Nevertheless, now here's the line, nevertheless, and they're talking about their experience, we find that our thinking will, as time passes, be more and more on the plane of inspiration. We come to rely on it. What does it mean to rely on inspirational thinking as opposed to trying to figure things out? I, I'm, I'm always... Uh, you see, when that guy came up to me and he told me that his best thinking told him at eight years sober that he'd had to get rid of his sponsees, he had thought about that real hard over a long period of time and it made absolute sense for him. And that was the way alcoholics think and that's what it led him to, the exact opposite thing of what he should do. And he told me what he wanted to do and I knew immediately that was the wrong thing to do and I didn't even have to figure it out. I mean, what's the, I mean, what do you want to be involved in? You want to be in, involved in his way of thinking, which always leads you down the wrong path, you know, or a different way of thinking, inspirational thinking. So I happen to be, so I, I, I'm, start, I'm, I'm sort of, 
with 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 what has happened to me, one of the things that's happened to me is I don't I don't think real hard about a lot of things. I really don't. I I, I don't. Um, Some, something happened at dinner that I won't share, but I mean, it, it happens to me. Well, people will, will, people in the, in the world will invite you to think. They'll invite you. It's like satanic. They'll, they'll, they'll invite you to get. They'll, they'll say, a guy will come up to you and say, "What do you think about this?" And then he'll say something. It's like beckoning you to enter the world of thinking. What do you think about this? I mean, something that you haven't been thinking of, you've never thought about, you don't even want to think about. You know what I mean? And you know, you you can tell that you don't even like the question. You know what I mean? And you see what I used to do is, you know what I used to do? I used to start thinking about it. But that's because I didn't understand the question. The question is, he said, what do you think about this? And now I know what the answer is. I don't. Now I understand the answer. You see, let me tell you something. Here's the deal. I got a lot. I can't, no matter what kind of degrees I have, how smart I think I, here's the deal. I, I am gratified by the, the, the amazing number of things I never think about. You'd be surprised how easy life can get when you cut down that thinking. See, you know, you know those 50 million voices in your head, 5,000 thoughts at the same time about everything? Man, wouldn't it be great if you get like those thoughts li lined up like one at a time? You know what I mean? You're like one thought and then ready for this, then another thought. And then another thought, sort of like in lockstep. And you know what it would be like if, if you, what would it be like if like you had like a space between thoughts? That would be like a wild deal. What if you could sort of like, you know, maybe get like a nanosecond space between thoughts? That's probably when the still small voice comes in. It's a great line in Kings, you know, which means something to me today. You know, in Kings, you know, Elijah comes out and he's looking for God because he's looking for help because he's desperate. He's desperate. You guys wouldn't understand what desperation is, right? That's when you heard the voice. You know, that's when you heard the voice. When you know, when, well, as they said, when the circumstances of your life came at you faster than your ability to lower your standards, and you were like deers in headlights, and you couldn't think anymore, and you gave up the ghost, and all of a sudden you stopped to think, and all of a sudden you heard the voice. Not when you were running around like Bill Wilson with the worldly clamors and worried about the mortgage and worried about this and worried about that. When you gave up the ghost. You know, and you stopped all the thinking and you gave up trying to figure it out, that's when you got the inspirational message. And it wasn't even loud. It was it was the it was like Elijah looked where he says he said he said the earthquake came and God wasn't in the earthquake. He said the fire came and God wasn't in the fire. He says the tornado came, God was in the uh, tornado, but after the fire, after the tornado, after the earthquake, a still small voice. When I was a child, there used to be a, a show called Lamp on the Feet, and that they, I used to say that hear that thing. I wasn't really interested in religion, but I used to listen to that. One line that you say the one thing, but after this, a still, small voice. That's how God sort of comes to you in a still, small, small voice. And, uh, you know, so I have a lot of people that beckon me to sort of think uh, differently. And, uh, and I'll tell you something, fellowshipping with people, sponsoring people, all that sort of stuff, it helps a tremendous amount with, with me. So one of the things, you, you a I ask people who have 20 years or 15 years, five years, is I ask them this question. It's almost like asking them whether they have a license or whether they have a job or whether they're married. They'll come up to me and they'll start telling me all their problems, and I ask them this question. You know what I ask them? I said, how many people are you sponsoring? I, I just ask them, how many people are you sponsoring? And you know what they say? They, most of the time they don't answer the question. They say, no, you got to understand. Let me explain to you what the problem is. But that's not my question. He says, it has nothing to do with that. I said, I understand that, but just to answer my question, how many people do you sponsor? And they'll say something like, well, what do you mean by sponsoring? You know, and <laughs> you know what the answer is, don't you? And some, you know when somebody has a problem and they, they ask me uh, and they ask me to solve their problem and ask them how many people they're sponsoring, you know what the answer is, don't you? It's always none. It's always zero. You think that's like a coincidence? It's always zero, you know. Guys that sponsor, it's not the guys that sponsor, a lot of people don't have uh, problems. You know, and there's always a reason why. Well, nobody asked me. You know, well, nobody asked you. You know why nobody asked you? Because you're not talking enough at groups. Well, I'm not a talker. I said, well, it's your life. Then stay miserable. Well, that, that's not my personality. Well, your personality's killing you. That's what's killing you, your personality. You came in here to transform. 
to reach out, to get stronger, to, to get, get past your personality. You know, well, I mean, you need to go to more meetings. Well, what if nobody asks me? Well, then you inflict yourself on somebody. You know, you're, if I said to you, if I said to you, you were going to die tomorrow unless you got somebody to sponsor, would you say, well, nobody's going to ask me. I think I'll just die. You know, you'd be going to some treatment center saying, I've been assigned to you. I'm helping you. You do whatever you, it's your life. It's your life, right? So I, um. I want to talk about a couple of stories. I want to, I want to, uh, there's stuff I want to read in the book, but I really want to talk about, I want to share some stories about, which have to do with sponsors and sponsoring and things like this and um, the Good Samaritan. And, but, oh, but I, want, I, I don't want to miss this one. One of the points I was, I was thinking about is, so I'm, I started, I was at this Bible study, and I started thinking about, we were studying something having to do with Joseph, and which code of many colors, you all know that story, and it's a long story, it's a whole big deal, but. Uh, there was something that came up during it that was really um, uh, interesting, I found, about the nature of God in my life. Because I don't really understand God. I really don't get him at all. I don't understand him. But then again, if I understood God, he wouldn't be much of a God. I mean, all power, I'm pretty puny compared to God, so I don't really worry about the fact that I don't understand him. I'm just, I, I just want to grab like a piece. You know, I'm satisfied like a one half of one half of one half of one percent. You know what I mean? I'll get, I'll take, I'll be satisfied with a piece of God. You know what I mean? I don't have to know the whole deal. And and one of one of the things that I realize, which I'm sort of, um, is that whenever God, or I should say, most of the times in the Bible, at least, and uh, maybe even in, in, in a, most when when God intersects with man, big time, like with Moses. The, you ever hear of the burning bush story? It's, it was in all the papers about 3,000 years ago. <laughs> Bernie Bush, Moses, goes back down to Egypt, let my people go. There was a movie on it, Charlton Heston. I don't know. Well, if you haven't heard on it, you'll have to ask somebody about this deal. But Moses is in the desert, and he, he comes upon a bush that burns but doesn't consume itself, you know, because God showed up like that in different things, you know. And so he goes up to the bush, and he's, you know, you're on holy ground. And he's at, well, he says, so, so uh, he, he tells Moses who just left Egypt because he was under a murder indictment for murdering somebody to go back there after like 30, 40 years and tell the Pharaoh, which is the king, to let all the Jews go. So Moses is a little nervous about this deal. This is, he's even more nervous than if somebody told him to go to an AA meeting, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing he asks God is he says, well, who do I, who do I say your name is? What, and, and God says, well, I am what I am. Moses, of course, says, thanks for clearing that up, you know. And, and then he says, well, I don't know what to say. What am I going to say? And God says, I'll give you, I'll, I'll tell you what to say. And that's it. It's adios, take your brother, you're gone. And what I've noticed in my life is the truth is when I start thinking so much and I get my instructions, the inspiration comes, God, just like Moses, God never seems to take me into his confidence, Puts his arm around me and says, Russ, let me explain this to you. Here's my feelings about things. You know, and he never sort of, he, it's only, I'm like on a need to know basis. I really, it's, God is not my co-pilot. I mean, I'm sure he's all excited about that. Oh, Russ, oh, I'm waking up today. I'm God. I said, I'm excited. Russ is going to let me help him pilot the plane. No, God, God is the guy in charge. He's the one I'm seeking. And I am really on a need to know basis. And there's a lot of things. I can't tell you how many things I do not need to know. And in the book it says, later on, clear-cut directions will be shown as to how we stayed sober. And how well you do in this thing is going to be measured to a great deal on how much you're able to follow instructions like Moses as opposed to have a need to know. You see, if you're a guy that is always fighting this thing because you need to know and you need to understand that's what we call, that's how we weed people out. If you think you're smart because you're trying to figure this thing out and you're going to figure this thing out, understand that to the extent you're trying to figure this thing out, you're weed. That's why you don't have to be smart to be an AA. We have a lot of smart people that never make it. Okay? The people that make an AA are the people that follow directions. Because that requires, you ready for this? Humility. Because no matter how loud you are, what your personality is, and I'm basically an upfront guy, you know, I don't mind being around crowds and everything, that has nothing to do with the ego thing. Anybody who talks knows one of the most ego deflating things is talking in front of a group of people. You know, and, uh, you know, the next time you start thinking, well, somebody's got a big ego because they're talking, what you need to do is get up here and do it. You're going to find out all about the third step. Trust me, you'll find out all about the third step when you've got 100 people staring at you and you're talking. You'll find out all about ego. 
and where that's all about. Ego is sitting in the back of the room, being quiet all the time, judging the person who's talking, thinking that you're better than them. While you're thinking, why aren't I up there? That's ego. <laughs> that's ego. Ego is not doing this stuff. So, you know, it requires humility to, uh, to lay yourself out and lay yourself open. You know, and just do something because it's been given to you and you've been told to do it. Go down there and get the guys out. You know, tell Frail World. I'll tell you what. And just It requires humility and it requires faith. You know, it has, you know why I can do this and it's easy for me? It really is easy for me. I've got to be honest with you. This is easy for me. You know why? Because I have faith that the Lord will give me the words. And you know something? He's never let me down. He's never let me down. I also have faith if he didn't give me the words because that's the way it's supposed to be. And that's okay too. You know, I mean, you got to develop a lot of, it's sort of like counterintuitive in here. It's a whole, it's a whole different thing, you know, in this deal, relying on faith and inspirational thinking than relying on your own in intellect. Because to the extent that you rely on your thinking, you really haven't determined that you're powerless. So you really haven't given up the ghost, have you? No. So I, uh, I, uh, I was. I, I might have told you this story, but I want to. There's two stories I really want to tell you. Maybe two or three I want to tell you, but um, uh, I want to tell. I want to tell them to you. I don't want to lose one, but I'll. I'll uh, I had a. Um, uh, you know, when you've been sober for 25 years, there's a lot of stories. You know, but uh, I was thinking about this one uh, deal. Um, I was uh, about five years sober. And I'm not going to get into a great deal of detail. I was going through a very difficult time. Um, uh, it seemed the time seemed to be the, what was difficult for me was professional nature. I had a very very serious case where I rent, represented a young man who was facing a lot of time in the state penitentiary. You know, 20, 30 years. He had a wife. He had a little baby. He came from a good home. His father and mother were just great people. A professor, I think, from. MIT, and, his, and, and I was before probably the toughest judge in Broward County at the time. It was a big case. And I'd been paid a lot of money to try to represent him, and, uh, and there was overwhelming evidence of guilt against him. I mean, you know, they didn't need me. They needed Jesus. I'm going to tell you, I, they, this guy, this kid wasn't getting off. And uh, some of you people might know who this judge is. He'd go into his chambers. He'd have, he's no longer alive. He'd have, have an electric chair on his, on, in his desk. It always gives you a warm feeling. <laughs> yeah. But uh, in any event, so, uh, so and, and every time I'd see this kid with his family and his little baby, he'd say, and, and, and we're going down the tubes, and he's about to spend 30 years in jail, he would say something like this. He says, you know, we're not even worried, Mr. Spatz, because we have complete faith in you. <laughs> Listen. I don't know whether it made me feel crappy because I'm an alcoholic. I tend to think a regular person wouldn't feel so good about that deal. What do you think? How would you like that deal on your hands? You know? Oh, Mr. oh, we, we oh, listen. We're not worried at all. We 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 we're relying completely on you. We trust you completely. You know? And, and I got the judge with the electric chair. In any event, I, I went. I went to a. Um, I went to a, um, uh, a, a. My sponsor, my sponsor, Bob Sullivan, at the time. I had never been to a retreat, and my wife had been telling him that I was. I, I think she had been talking about me behind my back. <clears throat> and uh, he pulled up one day and he said, on a Friday afternoon, I was deep in thought, worrying about this case, probably. And he said, get in the car. And I said, what do you mean get in the car? He says, we're going to a retreat. <clears throat> I said. I can't go to retreat, Bob. I got things going on. I got a case. I got this thing in Broward. I got stuff. He says, get in the car. We're going to retreat. He says, I can't do that. We're going to, we're going to, he says, get in the car. We're going to retreat. So I turned around and my bags were already packed and there was my wife with my bags. I got into the car. I went in the retreat. You know, because my best thinking, you remember like that kid I sponsored had told me, I don't have time to go to this retreat. That's what my best thinking told me. I mean, really, I had thought real hard about this. This was ridiculous. I can't go to a retreat. That's what my thinking was. So I went to the retreat. So I'm at the retreat. It's being done by a guy named Father Al Grau, who was actually up here. A lot of guys may have known him. He had like 
35, 37 years sobriety. He was a PhD in psychology, was a Jesuit priest, was a prisoner of war <clears throat> in the, for the Japanese. I mean, he was like the guy. You can get two more. more. He was a Jesuit. You, you can get more spiritual than this, this guy. And, uh, and so he's doing the thing, and I'm starting to get into it. I'm listening to it. So I, I figure, you know, I'm going through a tough time. I'm scared. I know I'm going to blow this thing. I know that it's all going to be on me. It's all my fault. I screwed it all up, and, you know, I didn't do the right. Whatever the hell, whatever the hell is going through, whatever, whatever would be going through your mind was going through my mind. You know, my death in the Western Hemisphere. You know, and uh, I, um, I, uh, uh, so what happened is during the retreat, as they do sometimes retreats, the retreat master who was, Al Grau says, anybody wants to talk to me, do their fifth step, talk to me about anything, put their names up on the board, put my name up on the board, I go in to speak to Al Grau. So I sit down with him. He was running the Palm Beach Institute. Uh, which was an institute for people with cocaine addictions and stuff like that. And this case was all about cocaine and stuff. And, uh, you know, and, and I went in to talk to him. And I, I sat down with him and he said, you know, how can I help you? And I started telling him about, I started explaining to him about this deal, you know, what was going on and my fear and, what, you know, like I'm explaining to you. And he said, he stopped me after one minute. He says, hey, listen, he says, I'm not really the right guy to talk to about this stuff. And I said, no, 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 no. He says, you are the right guy. You're the guy. You know what I mean? I know you're the guy. I know you are. He says, no, I'm not the guy. He says, no, 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 you're the guy. He says, listen to me. I wrote, work with cocaine addiction all the time. I work with mothers that are cocaine addicted. I work with babies that are cocaine addicted. You know, he says, I am not the right guy to handle this thing. You need somebody different. He says, no, no, Father, you're the right guy. He says, okay, so he continues to let me speak for about three more minutes, uh, whatever it is, five minutes until I spoke myself out. And then he, I said, what do you think? And he said, this is what I think. He says, what? He says, I think you're full of shit. <laughs> and then for the next 15 minutes, he just beat the living crap out of me for representing drug dealers, for taking money. for who, I mean, he just went wild on me. And then after he got out his venom and went wild on me, he got a little bit more sober. And he started telling me some other things about how dare I think that this guy is in trouble because it has anything to do with me. You know, where did I get such an ego that thinking that, you know, if this deal had gone through, you know, he'd be spending his money and I wouldn't be around. And who did I, he started just whipping up on me in another way, up and down and sideways. And, and I walked out of there and, you know, I, I'm not even Catholic, you know what I mean? But I, I know, I just somehow knew intuitively that priests aren't supposed to tell you you're full of shit. Because I had seen the movies. I think you're, you're supposed to say, do three Hail Marys, and they're supposed to do something, like genuflect or something. I knew he, like, had violated some sort of law of the church, you know? And so uh, I must have run into ten people while I was on my way back to my room, shell-shocked. And, um, I, of course, I had told every one of them, whatever you do, don't see that loony son of a bitch with the collar, you know? He's nuts, you know? So I sat down on my bed, and I and and you know I tell you this story because this story, I probably have a thousand of them. All this is is this is this illustrates this is an example of the deal we're involved in, or that you're not involved in that you're missing. And I started thinking. I started thinking about that that crazy wacky priest. What I was trying to do, and all I was doing was ask for help. What he said, what I said, I re, I, I, you know, I rewound it, started thinking about, you know, his death, you know, and all, you know, whatever, you, you know, how wrong he was, and blah blah blah. Yeah, you know, I started going through that alcoholic thing, you know, shooting him, killing him, chopping him up, you know. Sure, you don't know what it's like. You're laughing, and and um, somewhere along the line, I still remember it was like his yesterday. I'm sitting on this bed. It's like a bed. There's nothing in the room. If you ever go to that Dominican retreat, there's like there's like a bed and a cross. That's it, you know. Exactly what a Jewish kid from New York needs. You know what I mean? Perfect, perfect. You know, no, that, was, that was Jesus, Jewish kid from New York. So in any event, so you got this bed, and, and I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden this thing goes across my mind. And here's the thought that goes across my mind: Maybe he's right. Man, you got to watch that shit. <laughs> Oh, you see, that's what AA will do to you. It sort of screws you up, you know what I mean? Because, you see, I can expand your mind, but the problem is I can't, like, put it back to the same deal. 
So that's the problem you have. You can love me or hate me. It doesn't matter. Once you hear me, you're screwed. You're screwed because you can hate me just like I hated Al Grau, but somewhere along the line you may be driving along when you least suspect it, and without your knowledge, out of nowhere, come sort of thing like maybe he's right, and then you're screwed. Then all of a sudden you change, you know, because you're, you're, you're walking in one direction. You know, if you don't change the direction you're walking, you're going to wind up where you're headed, and you're headed for getting rid of the sponsor, and all of a sudden you intersect with somebody who pisses you off, and next thing you know you're walking in another direction. And somebody asks you 10 years down the road, how did you ever get in this direction? You say, well, some, some guy, some idiot, you know what I mean? Said this to me or that or whatever. Why did that happen? How does that happen? And I, I said, maybe he's right. And the next thought that came after that was, he is right. And my fear left like that. I wasn't worried anymore. And a way of thinking about how I handle clients and, quite frankly, how I handle people. Quite frankly, how I deal with sponsees. How I deal with anybody who in any way try to manipulate or faust their own shortcomings on me to make me see, feel somehow guilty or screwed up changed in a nanosecond. And if you know anything about alcoholics, the sickest, weirdest, craziest alcoholic has an amazing penchant for living a totally irresponsible, crummy, horrible life, suffering consequences, and just somehow, because of some aroma we send off, have anybody that's sitting around them feel somehow that they're responsible for it. Not only that they're responsible for it, but they've got to cure it or do something about it. And that's why we've started this whole group. It's all started because of us, called al -Anon. And the only thing these guys, the only thing, the problem these guys have an Al-Anon, Al you know what's the only problem they have? Is that they know us. <laughs> they have no problem except they actually have met us. They met us and they got a disease. That's how powerful the sickest alcoholic is, you know what I mean? But let me tell you something. It's funny, it's funny until you realize that we can have, the, that sponsees can have the same effect on you that we can have the same effect on each other. It's, we're powerfully, powerfully toxic, you know? It's powerfully toxic What an alcoholic, you know, who won't stay sober or won't follow the rules or won't try to do something against it can have effect on somebody who really wants to do this deal, you know what I mean? And is trying to find and somehow feels responsible for them. I'm responsible to try to carry the message. I'm not responsible to carry the alcoholic. But here's the deal. The deal is it was lifted from me. Just lift it from me, the way I, I, just a different way of thinking. And it happened, and you know, God, you know, is such a great surgeon. He's a master surgeon. He knows exactly how much to cut, and it hurts, <clears throat> but he just cuts so much. You know, how, how did this whole thing happen? If I didn't have a sponsor, and I'm talking about a strong relationship with a sponsor, I'm talking about the kind of relationship with a sponsor, <clears throat> because let's face it, I'm not, I'm no shrinking violet. I'm, no, I'm not a guy. I mean, I'm a trial, seasoned trial attorney, former division chief for the states of tri murder. I'm not one of these guys that gets pushed around most of the time. <clears throat> you know, how, does it, how did I get to that retreat in the first place? And I had already decided I wasn't going. If I didn't have a relationship, a strong relationship with that sponsor, I would never round up, wound up at that retreat. And even once winding up on that retreat, when I went to see Al Grau, if Al Grau didn't have whatever it takes to be the kind of sponsor or person he was to look at me and tell me the truth in the harshest terms possible, you know, I'm convinced that he, if he had left out the word shit and said, you're just full of yourself, you know what I mean? It wouldn't have worked. I needed, every, I needed that word. I needed, I, listen, I, I'm convinced I, I've worked with alcoholics for 25 years. We're unbreakable. We're, <laughs> alcoholics cannot, we cannot, we break. We, 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 we break other people. We don't break. When the nuclear bomb goes off, the only thing that's left is cockroaches and us. You know, you don't have to worry about hurting an alcoholic, you know. When they run out the door and say, I'm leaving, you know, adios muchacho. If I'm your excuse for leaving alcoholics, use me. 
Use me as a reference. Why'd you leave Alcoholics Anonymous? You know, kill you say it was Russell's fault. You know what I mean? Fine. If it's not me today, it's somebody else tomorrow. It don't matter. Where are they leaving for? They're leaving for the drink, you know? But I'm convinced that I need to have the truth right between the eyes. If it wasn't for Al Grau, thank you very much. Saying that to me, I would have never had that thing going on. And that's all about relationships and intense relationships with sponsors and everything. How can you do this? And that, as I said, that deal that I'm talking about, either more or less, I got a thousand stories like that over my life as to where I was intercepted or moved away, just like that kid who came up to me and said, and I, I'm amazed all the time I get calls from people who I sponsor who before they do something insane, absolutely insane, they call me up. I think it's the most amazing thing in the world. In their worst possible nightmare position, they call me up and they say, I'm thinking of doing this, what do you think? <laughs> now I have the other type of person who has less of a, of a relationship with me that, I, that, that tells me what the jam they in, and I said, why did you do that? And I said, I did this, that, that tell me about it after they do it. You understand? That's a different type of relationship. There's, there's two different types of relationship. There's, there's the guy you never see. Will you sponsor me? You never see him again. And then there's the, guy, there's the guy you see who picks up the phone, and before they do anything, they ask your advice. And then there's the guy who just basically sort of reports to you how his life is going down the tubes when he did something, you know, already. You understand? It's all about relationships and your willingness to really submit yourself, you know, to another human being. It's a, you know, we, we can talk about this high-flying, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I have a hard time getting my hands around words like humility. I mean, what does it mean? I mean, I, I don't even know how you get it, how you have it. or what, I mean, I, 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 you wake up in the morning and you say, well, I think I'll be humble today. You know what I mean? I, I think you've lost it as soon as you've said it. I don't, I'm not real, I'm good at arrogance, you know. But I think, I think, I think I, but I know it when I see it. And I think I think you can ask. I, I think I think humble people do certain things. I think I think that somebody who is humble and, and I don't even I, believe me. I don't think I'm humble at all, you know. But but uh, you know. But you know the great thing about this is you don't have to be that humble. You just have like like one percent will do it. It's amazing how how we are. I am so sick. I am so bad. Listen, if I just if I could just be. 2% humble, that's enough, you know what I mean? Just a little bit, you know? I was never. And, you know, I think things like having a sponsor, I think it counts. I think things like uh, calling up a sponsor and asking his advice, I think that tells me something. If You could tell me you're doing the steps that the cows come home. If you're not calling up another, if a man isn't calling up another man, and this may sound like a baby. It may sound childish. Well, you just have to examine your life, and you determine whether you've been a man or a child. You know what I mean? I mean, I am childish sometimes. If you don't have another, if you're a man and you don't have another man in your life that you're calling up and asking advice or being mentored to, you know that tells me something about you. Period. And you can tell me till the cows come home that I don't understand. I've been told by the best of them that I don't understand. As soon as you tell me that you don't have a man you're calling up and asking advice about, I know everything I need to know about you. I don't even need to know the details. I know you don't want AA. You're not in AA. You don't care about AA. You think this program's full of shit, and you're just trying to grab what you can to the answers so you can get out of here because you certainly don't want to do what we're asking here because your refusal to just comply with that little thing tells me something about your personality, something about the first step, and certainly something about the third step. It tells me all about you. If you're not sponsoring people, if you've been here a few years and you're not sponsoring people, you can tell me to the cows come home how many four steps you're doing. You can tell me how many treatment centers you've been to. You can tell me about all your psychiatrists. You can tell me about the details you like. You can tell me how you were raped when you were a child, and this is the problem. You can tell me all about it. If you're not sponsoring people and you've been doing this thing, that tells me everything I need to know about you. I don't need the details. You don't have to tell me you don't understand. You know, you want to tell me everything you're doing. I understand you want to tell me everything you're doing to prove that you're doing AA Super and it's not your fault. You're just that, you're just that special that it's just not working for you, you know. Well, maybe you're one of the rare ones, right? That's what my sponsor said. Doesn't say rarely have we seen a person fail as thoroughly fallen. Maybe you're one of these guys that do this thing thoroughly and it's just not going to work for you. But as soon as you tell me 
that you're not sponsoring people, I know exactly what's going on with your deal. You're not doing that. One thing that they wrote a whole chapter about when they say working with others where they said practical experience shows that not, nothing is, has uh, ensured sobriety as, as intensive work with alco other alcoholics. And you want to know something? The fact that you're pissed at me telling you that only means to me that it's the truth because that's what's pissing you off because you want to deal with everything but the truth. So here's what it says in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. It says, nine, uh, page 97, never avoid the, these responsibilities, but be sure you are doing the right thing if you assume them. Helping others is the foundation stone of your recovery. I am very fortunate. Now, of course, I believe in God, so I don't believe in coincidence, you know, and I use the word fortunate or lucky or something, but it really I believe it was just a godsend, that the men... I came in contact with people like Joe Snyder, Bob Sullivan, all these men um, were <laughs> big book thumpers. They believed in the big book. They worked the big book. You know, we were, they were intensely involved in sponsoring people. They sponsored a lot of people. They had a lot of sponsees, you know, and we had like litters, packs of litters. We ran, you know, there's a lot of Joe sponsees here tonight. And, uh, and they believed in going down to detox centers. They believed in taking people, picking people up. I was on the relay, the 12-step relay. Uh, every Friday night between 11 o'clock at night and, and 8 o'clock on Saturday morning, if you called up AA in Dade County for eight years, you got me, which probably is why nobody stayed sober during that period of time. <laughs> I had one guy call me. Well, you know, it's a, learning, it's a real learning experience when you're getting those calls, you know. You know, most of the calls are horseshit. You never know what's horseshit or not. Most of the calls are horseshit. You know, because they just, you don't understand, and they blah, 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 and they tell you all about their life, and they say, will you hold on for a second? Yeah, sure, and you hold on, and you hear clink, 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 blah, 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 you know. And, and you speak to them for four hours because you're in that codependent stage, but I have to do this, I'm on AA, I'm in the committee, i got to sit there. So for four hours you talk to this person, it's 4 o'clock in the morning, you finally say, well, do you want to talk about not drinking? He says, not drinking, who wants to stop drinking? Why did you call me anyway, you know? You do that for a few times, you learn how to qualify them real fast. I had one girl call me. This is how you learn about this disease. You learn by going to, and how you learn about alcoholics. And you, 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 I mean, I, I jokingly say, but it's almost, I say when I sponsor somebody, body, this is the way I look at it. One of us is going to drink. It's not going to be me. You know, I, I, I think anybody I'm sponsoring is out to get me. They're out to get me drunk. So it's either going to be it's either him or me. It ain't going to be me. It's going to be him before it's me. So I'm on the line with some gal, and he, she calls me up and she says, "Look." I've done the A thing. I've been to A. I was sober four years. I'm a professional woman. I've got a Ph.D. I've got a child. This is 3 o'clock in the morning. He says, I'm a little bit worried because I just want to tell you. I just want to tell you. I started drinking. I'm a little bit concerned because I don't want to lose my job. I don't wanna, but, and, and I want to get your advice. But here's the one thing. I don't want to hear anything about Alcoholics Anonymous. Where do they get these fucking lines? This has got to be out of central casting. Where does a woman who's a professional woman call up Alcoholics Anonymous and say, I want to know how to stay sober? Where do they get this shit? You know what I mean? And I said to her, I said, look, lady, I'm sober eight years in Alcoholics Anonymous. You call me up and say you want to know how to stay sober, but don't mention Alcoholics Anonymous. It's like a non-starter in the conversation. I don't know what plan B is. You know, <laughs> never figured it out. You know, they call you up from bars and say, I need you to send a cab. Somebody over pick me up and take me to detox. I said, you must have mistaken us for the taxi. You must have mistaken us for the taxi cab company. Never avoid these responsibilities, but be sure you are doing the right thing if you assume them. Helping others is the foundation stone of your recovery. A kindly act once in a while isn't enough. You have to act the good Samaritan every day. You have to act the good Samaritan every day. Now, I want to stop right there just for the hell of it, just to goof around for a second. It's not a goof, but it is a goof, but it's really not. But uh, it's just a point I want to make. Now, you guys really want to know this stuff, don't you? You want to have this stuff. You want to, what does it say, really? I've seen a person fail his style. He says, if you want what we have and are willing to go to any length. And you guys have already told me. I remember the first thing I said, are you willing to go to any length? Didn't I say that? Are you willing to go to any length? You know, I, I just like goofing on you like this because you're a bunch of alcoholics. You're all intelligent and, you know, and, and because you're intelligent and you, you got a good heart and you're warm and you really want this thing, most of it, you're, you're very easy to goof on. So you're going to have to excuse me for this, but I'm just going to give you something to get pissed off about, okay? It's just something to think about, okay? 
You, and it's okay. You can get pissed off at me for this, and you can say you could be. You could say I'll be like your Al Growl. You could say he violated all the rules. You can say he violated the rules. He can't do that. You know, he's he's an AA. So I want to say you want to know this deal, right? So so it says here's here's this part in this book. It says it's the foundation, and then it says it says a kindly act once well is enough. You have to act the good Samaritan every day. So that's a clear cut direction that you have to act the good. You understand that? That's a direction from Bill Wilson. These people, if you want to do this, you have to act the good Samaritan every day, right? What the fuck is a Samaritan? <laughs> What's a good Samaritan? What is the good Samaritan? It's in capital letters. Good is a capital G. S is a capital S. Why did he put that there? Where did he get that word? What does that mean? That, now, you may think, you know, just sort of general knowledge, well, doesn't that mean a good guy? No, that's not what it means. Well, does it, that just means a good person, you know, we help people. That's not what it means. That's not what it meant. He could have said, you have to be a good person every day. He could have said, you have to follow good orderly direction every day. He could have said that. He didn't say that. He said, you have to act a good Samaritan every day. Now, I know a book where you can learn all about the good Samaritan. <laughs> Most of you are never going to read it. So you'll never know what he really meant. You'll just sort of be satisfied with guessing. And the reason you won't read it is because you're scared. That's the only reason. You'll be scared because you're just scared of what other people will think about you. You'll be scared that something will happen to you. You'll just be scared because you really won't want to change because it won't be that important to you. But some of you will read it, and then you'll learn something, and it'll change your life. And that'll be the deal. And one day you'll be talking in front of a group, and you'll be talking about this. That'll be the deal. You'll be talking about me like I was talking about Al Ground. You have to act a good Samaritan every day if need be. It may mean loss of many nights sleep, great interference with your pleasures, interruptions to your business. It may mean sharing your money and your home, counseling frantic wives and relatives, innumerable trips to police courts, sanitariums, hospital jails, and asylums. Your telephone may jack up time every night. Your wife may sometimes say she is neglected. You see, honey, it's all in the book right there. <laughs> when I was six months sober, you know, you know how they say alcoholics, you know, forget we're forgetters, we're forgetful about how we were? When I was six months sober, I was going out to my AA meeting, and my wife said to me, says, what if I told you if you walked out the door and went to that meeting, I was going to leave you? And she may not even remember this. And I said to her, I said, he says, honey, I love you, and I hope you don't leave me, but I'm going, I'm going to the meeting. And I went to the meeting. And, you know, she's rarely, if ever, really beat the crap out of me for AA again. I mean, she said some things, and I know, and, and there was, and there's also a time when my sponsor said, you need, you're neglecting your family. You need to spend more time. And even now, in my life, I've been married for 25 years, and she knows this. Every once she says, oh, you're another step meeting, another this, that, and the other thing. But the truth is, in my life, she sort of accepts the fact that this is my deal. I can't tell you how many guys I know. You know, only one half of 1% make it. I can't, I can't tell you how many guys don't make it because they've never been able to do that deal. Because, I, because, you know, if I said to my wife that night, you're right, I'll stay home, I won't go to the meetings, even though I said I would go to, if I said that, what about the next night when she was feeling a little antsy or something? She says, well, I don't want you to go tonight either. And I said, well, I have to go. Well, you didn't have to go the other night. And what about the next night? The next night, you wanted something, it wouldn't have been the next night because I would have been drunk after two years. And I wouldn't have had that wife. You understand what I'm saying? So who's going to have make the decision for me to go to AA if it ain't going to be me? It ain't going to be my wife. Because the day's going to come when she doesn't want me to go. For whatever reason. Doesn't matter, but you know, but she's not the one who's going to drink. So I ran into sponsors and people who were doing this stuff. You know, it wasn't a matter of waiting around for somebody to to ask you to be a sponsor. I don't know about that crap to be a sponsor. I know about going down to South Miami Hospital and walking the halls at night. I know about volunteering for institution meetings. I know about that stuff. That's the stuff I know about. That's what I was involved in. That's what twelve step work is about. You know, and that's what you need to get involved in in this deal. And uh, it works. Uh, it worked for me, and I, uh, I implore you to do it. God bless you all. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.